Lee was originally educated at the University of Albany. He got his PhD at Binghamton, studying with David Sloan Wilson. Uh, he's been at the University of Louisville for many years. Many of you know his work because you've used his animal behavior textbook. Anyone who's here and teaches evolution knows that his textbook with Carl Bergstrom is the standard for ASU. And those of you who haven't read it should take a look. I mean, the way I've educated myself about evolution is to read all the textbooks that come out. And this one is just plain more interesting uh, than the other ones. It has actual examples that are not from the 19th century. It's quite wonderful. Um, so I, I, it also teaches you how to think instead of just citing the same old examples. Um, again, a special encouragement to come here tomorrow at 5.30. And please tell us ahead of time because there is food order. Uh, today's talk. Um, is about the case of E. coli and antibiotic resistance, and it turns out to be yet again in this theme that Leah's pursued his entire career about evolution and the origins of cooperation and altruism. In addition, I, I think this is, by the way, the eighth talk he has given so far in 2016, and we're not that much far through January. Um, his books I recommend, in addition to his textbooks, I don't know how he does it, he writes these marvelous he calls them popular books. His book about Prince Kropotkin is a wonderful read and will teach anybody who reads it a great deal about evolutionary biology. And his earlier book about interviewing people about their ideas about altruism also helps you get a real feel for how people have struggled with these ideas. Without taking any more of his time today, Lee, tell us about the case of E. coli and antibiotic resistance. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. And, um, Thanks to uh, Randy and Athena and everybody who was involved in, uh, in bringing me here. And it's, uh, it's a delight to see old friends and, and to meet new people. I've learned so much in the last 24 hours. I, I need time to, to let it soak in. But um, I, today I'm going to talk to you, um, like Randy said, about um, altruism in E. coli or something like altruism, I'll argue. Uh, so I, I was trained as a behavioral ecologist. I've, been interested in the evolution of altruism and cooperation ever since uh, the start of grad school. And you know, behavioral ecologists, when we when we think about this sort of thing, we um, we like to have sort of um, oh, my clicker's not working here. Hold on, let me make sure. Uh, okay, we always pull out this classic example of altruism in warm, fuzzy things. So these are ground squirrels. And many of you probably know this story that if, you, um, if there's a predator in the neighborhood and some of the ground squirrels stand up and they give this piercing alarm call, right? And standing up on your hind legs in the middle of the field when there's a predator around makes you the most likely one to get taken. But everybody else runs for safety. And so you have the kind of classic. Um, altruism where it's costly to the individual who does it and it's beneficial to others and this this issue has, has has been something that evolutionary biologists have pondered from the time of Darwin and even arguably before that um, and and so you know for a long time this is the way I was thinking about altruism trying to understand it uh, when I got to the University of Louisville 20 years ago um, I was getting to know the folks in my department. And turns out we have a couple of microbiologists. And uh, we just sat down over lunch one day. And I was sort of telling them about altruism and cooperation and that sort of thing. And you know, we got to talking. And, and I said, well, you know, there are a couple of microbial systems that people at that time had been looking at to un to, um, in which there might be something along the lines of altruism going on. Slime mold would be a classic example that I'll talk about in the Darwin Day talk a little bit. Um, but at that time, there weren't many other systems, although now there are. And so after we chatted for a while, we decided you know, we'd like to build a nice microbial system where we could look at the evolution of altruism and altruistic-like behaviors. And while we're at it, let's pick something that might have some medical implications, both because this was something all of us were interested in and because we thought we had a much better chance to get the money in order to get the work up and running. And so we focused on looking at this in E. coli. And um, so, in, in, a, in, a bit, in a normal E. coli system, what you have are individual cells that can produce beta-lactamase. Uh, 
And the beta-lactamase is associated with genes that typically reside on plasmids. And the beta-lactamase breaks down ampicillin. So if you can break down ampicillin, that's great. When that antibiotic is around, you are safe. And if you can't and that antibiotic is around, you are in big trouble. So like I say, typically um, the, the genes associated with the production of beta-lactamase are on plasmids. And the standard E. coli cell will keep all of the beta-lactamase that they produced. So what we did was we got some E. coli strains from Rich Lenski, who's been doing this phenomenal 60,000 generation experiment on E. coli. And those E. coli cells produced beta-lactamase, and, and they kept it. But um, Rich and the whole E. coli community know everything you could possibly know about these E. coli cells and these strains. And so what we were able to do was to design a strain of E. coli cells that were identical to the classic E. coli cells, except that what they do is they secrete a, a proportion, a, some portion of the beta-lactamase that they produce into the environment in which they exist. And so simply by tweaking it with some genetic engineering, we have created cells that now are secreting this substance into the medium. And beta-lactamase is beta-lactamase. And if it's in the medium, it breaks down ampicillin just as well as if it's anywhere. So now we have these cells that if you happen to be near them and you are unprotected, you're safe if the beta-lactamase is in the medium right where you are. And we just wanted to have this so we could then begin to examine both some of the assumptions that typically are made when you're looking at systems where altruism occurs and do all sorts of competition experiments to see whether or not in our manufactured system we could get the coexistence of both types that do this arguably altruistic behavior, although you know, we've engineered it so they do that, but it's still something that I will show you some experimental data that suggests is costly for them to do and yet benefits others. And so we could run all of these kinds of competition experiments and, and look at a system where we knew a tremendous amount about the basic biology. I should add that although E. coli doesn't typically do this, we had to engineer the system, other microbes do. So it's not as if there aren't many, many systems in which cells do, in fact, excrete a small proportion or even sometimes a moderate amount of some substance that can benefit others. Okay. As we go along, we can, um, we can think more about whether or not these would be considered pure altruists or if maybe there's another term that's better. But to start with, I'm going to call them altruists because they protect others at a cost to themselves. And we'll, we'll look at, at the data that suggests that in a minute. So the basic strain that we created um, holds on to a good chunk of its beta-lactamase, but it secretes some of that into the medium. I'm not going to talk about the experimental work where we actually manipulate how much they secrete into the medium, but one can do that, and you can have them secrete lots or little, but, but, for the, but I just want to get the point here that they hold on to some of it and they secrete some of it. And so what we ended up doing was having a number of different E. coli strains that are isogenic except for the differences I'm going to talk to you about. And then we competed again. We competed them against each other in various competition experiments. So what we have are the classic E. coli cells. They produce beta-lactamase, they hold on to the beta-lactamase. We have the, um, for lack of a better term so far, the secretor types, the altruist types, they produce beta-lactamase, they hold on to some part of it, and they secrete some part of it. We also have two other strains that we've produced in order to really do comprehensive competition experiments that allow us to understand how evolution would operate in this system, right? And, and so what we did here in this strain that I'm going to refer to as cheaters um, is we have snipped out 
the plasmid that's associated, that houses the genes that are associated with the production of beta lactamase. Okay, so this cheater type is identical to the selfish type and the altruist, except that we've snipped out the plasmid that's associated with the production of beta lactamase. Okay? And I'm calling them cheaters because this is the way I think about the world, but, but basically um, uh, they are capable of surviving in the presence of a danger like antibiotics, but only if they're in the vicinity of other types that secrete out into the medium because they themselves are unprotected. And finally, we have a fourth strain of the E. coli, again, isogenic except that what we have done now is we have, we, we've snipped out the plasmid associated with the production of beta lactamase like we did in the cheater case, except that we've put back in another plasmid that's the same size but doesn't do anything and especially doesn't do anything associated with the production of beta lactamase. And the idea here was to be able to have some control uh, over the relative costs and benefits in the system. So, so these guys, the dummy plasmid strain, they have to carry around the plasmid that's about the same size as you typically find in E. coli that protect themselves with beta lactamase, right? But they don't protect themselves, so they're not producing anything. And so you can kind of parse out the costs, potentially, of the production of this beta lactamase by thinking about both the cost of having the plasmid per se and the cost of producing beta lactamase and then excreting it by, in one case, removing all everything so they don't have to pay any of those costs, and in another case, having them pay the cost of carrying around the machinery, although the machinery is essentially broken with respect to what it's supposed to do in this system. Um, this was the experimental setup that my colleague Ron Atlas um, devised. Um, the other collaborator here is a fellow by the name of Mike Perlin. And basically, um, the only thing I want to show you here is this is not done in a plated out system, but it's done in a system where we're constantly mixing everything together. Okay. And that's relevant for the evolution of altruism for lots of reasons that we're not going to have time to get into today. All right? But basically, everybody's constantly mixed up, and so um, there is no spatial segregation in this system. Um, it would be great to do a spatial segregation. We haven't done it yet. Okay, so I'm almost at the point where I'm going to start the competition experiments. But just, again, so that we're all on the same page, because I'm going to use all these terms for, for my strains, um, the self-protected strain, what I'm calling the selfish strain, survives perfectly well in the presence of antibiotics. The altruistic strain survives perfectly well in the presence of antibiotics, and this is when you only have that strain. Both of those strains do perfectly well. Cheater strain, if you have 100% cheater cells and you put antibiotics around, they all die, and we did many, many experiments to demonstrate that, that was that we, had, that, that we had that right. Same thing for the dummy strain. They have to carry the plasmid. It doesn't do anything with respect to antibiotics. So if they're by themselves, then they all die in the presence of <coughs> ampicillin. So as I'm walking through some of these competition experiments, I'm really going to be sort of, I'm going to be doing two things simultaneously. One is I really want to test some of the basic, basic assumptions that people make when they study out systems of altruism. And then I want to work towards testing for the possibility that we can have the coexistence of altruists and non-altruists over some reasonably long period of time. So the first hypothesis I want to look at goes like this. If there's a cost right, to having plasmids that house the genes that are associated with beta lactamase, Right, then there are certain of our strains that should pay that cost. The selfish strain, the altruistic strain, and the dummy strain. The cheater strain has this plasmid snipped out of it, so it does not have to pay that cost. If you don't have antibiotics around, right, then those three strains, the selfish, the altruistic, and the dummy strain,
they should all be approximately equal competitors in my system. And I first want to make sure that that's true before I run the most interesting competition experiments. So if you run a seven-day experiment, and I'm not sure exactly how many E. coli generations it is, but it's a lot, and you start off where 50% of your cells are selfish and 50% of them are the dummy strain. So both of these things are carrying a plasmid of about the same size. And you start them at 50% and you just let the experiment go for seven days. What you find is you know, you know, there's some fluctuation, but it's pretty tight around that 50-50. And you basically have pretty strong evidence that these are equal competitors in the absence of antibiotics. And you get pretty much the same thing if you compete the dummy strain against the altruistic strain. Two strains, again, that carry the plasmid, but we're looking at it in the absence of the danger, in the absence of the antibiotics. And again, you get a little bit more fluctuation early on, but they pretty much stay at that 50-50 um, proportions that you started the experiment at. Now, because the cheater strain, the one that has no plasmid, shouldn't have to pay the costs associated with having a plasmid and anything that that plasmid might do, then in the absence of antibiotics, they should outcompete the other strains. they would be in big trouble, potentially, if there are antibiotics around. We'll look at that in a minute. But when there are no antibiotics around, if I'm right that carrying the plasmid and having the plasmid do what it does is costly, if this really is an altruistic trait with respect to those secretors, then if I have the cheaters and I compete them against the other strains when there's no danger around, the cheater strains should do better. So now you've got a five-day experiment, and again, um, we're starting, these are pairwise competitions, so we're competing two strains against each other, and we are starting each strain at 50%. We've done many, many other starting conditions, and you get about the same end point. But I'm just going to talk about the ones that start at 50-50. So if you look at the dark line, then we've got altruistic, altruistic cells against our cheater cells. And if you look at the light line, then we've got our selfish types against the cheaters. And we have the frequency on the, on the y-axis, we have the frequency or the altruistic or the selfish strain. And what you can see is that compared to the cheaters, over time, either one, the altruists or the selfish types, when they're competing against cheaters, they go down in frequency, suggesting that they are paying some cost for carrying around the machinery associated with the production of beta-lactamase. Okay, so let me just go back here. Um, so what I want to do next in terms of competition experiments is really the most interesting one. And that is to see whether or not when I compete my cheater cells that are unprotected themselves uh, with my secreting altruists, whether I can get a stable coexistence of those types. Just briefly, before I get there, I just want to show you one simple model that we've developed that suggests that, in principle, we should, under the right conditions, get such a st stable coexistence. We've modeled this in, a, in many different ways with many different sets of assumptions, but I just want to show you one simple version, extremely simple graphic version of why you might expect that you can get the stable coexistence of altruists and non-altruists when there are antibiotics around, when there's danger around in this system. Okay, so um, again, this is just one of a number of different ways that you could, you could do this. So if you map out on the x-axis the frequency of altruists and on the y-axis you map out fitness and we refer to the costs and benefits in this system as B for benefits and C for the costs, then one assumption 
you might make is that you have to have a certain proportion of the cells, in our case, be secretors in order for anybody to be protected. You, you, there's a minimum frequency of altruists that are, are required before anybody else is protected by having altruists around. You don't have to make this assumption. You can do the model in different ways. But if you do, then you can map out simply the, um, the, the fitness function for for cheaters, uh, the way you see here, at, you start p min at uh, the fit, when they're below p min, their fitness is zero, so there aren't enough altruists around to protect them, they can't survive. And then after that, again, this is a linear relationship, it could be nonlinear, but um, you, you would assume that the, their fitness increases up to a value of b, which is when virtually everybody but a, the, the cheater in the population is an altruist, that's when it maxes out its fitness. So now if you add on a couple of other labels on your y-axis, your fitness axis, you can talk about one potential fitness function for your altruists, and that might look something like this. They have to pay some cost, and they can max out their fitness when m virtually everyone is an altruist. And at the highest point, their fitness would be B minus C, which is basically you pay the cost, but everybody else is an altruist. So that's the maximum benefit you could, maximum fitness value you could have on this graph. And you start off at some value below that. And again, I mapped it as a linear function. You don't have to. No, the, the, uh, the important part is that you expect some equilibrium frequency of your altruists and your cheater types, and you can actually, um, you know, you can show this analytically as well as graphically, where um, you know you can solve for for that equilibrium frequency. Again, you could do this in many, many, many different variants. I just want to give the sense that you can have. Uh, a theoretical reason to expect that you might have in this kind of system a stable coexistence of types. So we ran a bunch of experiments to see what would happen when we actually had altruists and non-altruists in a system where the antibiotic was around, where it was dangerous. Remembering again that if you are, if you don't produce beta lactamase um, and there are, and, and ampicillin around, is around, you're in big trouble unless somebody else is secreting it. So we ran a couple of different versions. This is the average of eight replicates. Okay? And again, in this case, in these eight replicates, they all started um, in this experiment, with half of the cells being altruists and half of them being the dummy cells. Again, the dummy cells carry around this plasmid that's about the same size as the plasmid that's associated with beta-lactamase production, but it doesn't produce beta-lactamase. Okay. And we ran the experiment for eight days in the presence of ampicillin, and what you see here is that while the vast majority of the cells are, in fact, the, um, the altruist cells. OK, so on the, I'm sorry, the, the y-axis is the frequency of um, the, uh, um, the so, so you're seeing the, the dark line is, is, is the uh, frequency of the altruist. The light line is the frequency of the dummy types. It doesn't matter if you start the system at 50-50. If you start it at 75-25 or 25-75, you get approximately the same endpoints. So the vast majority of the cells are, in fact, the altruistic types. But there's about 5% of the cells that are dummy types, right? And, we've, and we, we have markers that allow us to distinguish between the altruists and the dummy types. And about 5% of the cells are dummy types. And you can run this experiment out past eight days, and again, you find the same basic result. The vast majority are altruists, but around 5% of them are these dummy types that, that would, in fact, all be dead if you didn't have the altruists around. And if you take them out and you raise them up in the absence of the altruists but ampicillin, they are, in fact, all dead. So it's not as if they've acquired something. They are completely protect, protected by the altruists. So, and again, you can run this out longer, suggesting 
This plus the fact that regardless of where you start your initial frequencies, you end up around these frequencies suggests that this is um, a stable coexistence of altruists and non-altruists. Now, the reason that we have all of these four strains is because now we can make a very simple prediction, which is that we just saw this, the, the existence of the altruists and the dummy types, and the dummy types are around 5%. Right? But they have to pay the cost of carrying around that plasmid that doesn't do anything. So if you competed the altruists against the selfish types who are also unprotected but do not have to pay the cost of carrying around the dummy plasmid, then you would expect a stable coexistence in which the selfish types did better than the dummy types did when, when they're in, um, in, the, in the medium with altruists because they don't have to pay the costs of carrying around that dummy plasmid. So what you see here is a combination of what you saw a moment ago, which was the, um, the, the case against the dummies, but now I've also put in the altruists versus the cheaters, and what you see is that they do about twice to two and a half times as well as the dummy types. In other words, about 12 and a half percent of the cells that survive, that are there on day six, and again, you can run this out longer, you get about the same results. Um, about 12 and a half percent are these cheater types, where it was only 5 percent, now it's 12 and a half percent because they don't have to pay the cost of carrying around the plasmid. Now, this was all fine and good. We were sort of excited that we had this nice microbial system where we have the coexistence of these two different types. Um, but we and a number of reviewers um, were concerned about the following. Um, you know, when you think about the evolution of, of a system like this, uh, you, would, you would really want to ask yourself, OK, so suppose I had one type that was present initially. Could the other type make its way into that population, and could we end up with having two types that might produce these kinds of sta stable coexistences, but you got to get past the point where you have only a single type. So can we get the evolution of more than one type from where we start with a single type, and so presumably get to this kind of solution we see here? And there are two ways you could do that. One way, and the way that ideally you would like to do it as an evolutionary biologist would be to start with a population that's completely composed of, che composed of cheater cells because we tend to think of that as the kind of primitive stage. Right? They don't have what we're interested in and we can ask whether or not we would get the de novo evolution of altruists, altruists in, a pop, in, in, in a population that was all made up of cheaters. Problem is that you could spend your whole life or a very long amount of time and never really expect to see the complicated sorts of machinery that we're talking about evolve in that time frame. Although in principle, you would love to do that experiment. The other way is much simpler, right? You start with the altruists and because it's not uncommon during cell division to lose plasmids. If you do this enough in large enough population sizes, the plasmid that's associated with the production of beta-lactamase in the altruists will in some cases just naturally be lost during cell division, in which case you have automatically created the cheater type and you can ask what happens when that occurs, what happens next. So that's the route that we took. So we ran four replicates, and in each of these replicates, we started with 100% of the cells being altruists, pure these secretor types, right? And we ran the experiment, in this case, for almost a month, and for the first week and a half or so, nothing interesting happened, which, by which I mean every cell was still an altruist. And we were going in and we're sampling, and what you find is at about a week and a half or so, in two of the strains, one or a small number of cells have lost the plasmid associated with the production of beta-lactamase. And then you can watch over the rest of the experiment what happens. Those types 
So the y-axis is the proportion of cells with no plasmid, no plasmid meaning the plasmid we're interested in, okay? The plasmid associated with beta-lactamase production. And in both the strains, in both these replicates where some of the cells, one or a few of the cells lose that plasmid, they begin, that type begins to increase in frequency. And again, you know, I don't know if, if, if we have really strong evidence for, for kind of a, a, an equilibrium, a stable equilibrium. It looks like by the time we're at the end of this month-long experiment, both of those replicates have settled down to the frequencies you see there. Yeah? This is in the presence of penicillin, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry. Gotcha. Yes, absolutely. And what was exciting for us was that... Again, it's only, we, only two of these four replicates ended up with cheaters emerging naturally. But in both of those, the frequency that it sort of settles down near is, in this case, about 10, 11%, which is very close to the frequency that it settled down at when we started with both strains, which is what you would expect if you, in fact, have a stable coexistence of types. So regardless of how you start the system, you end up in about the same place. So you get the stable coexistence of both altruists and non-altruists. Now, you know, afterwards when we're doing questions, we could debate um, the exact terminology that I'm using here. And I, I understand there, there might be some, some argument that these aren't quite exactly precisely what we mean by altruists in the classic sense. But they're, they're doing something that's benefiting others at a cost in, to themselves, even though they might not be doing it exactly the way that classic altruists do. So one of the reasons that we liked this kind of system for looking at the evolution of behaviors that help others, altruistic behaviors, is that unlike something like a squirrel alarm call that will warn other squirrels, but except for some very, very interesting exceptions, won't be warning anybody else besides ground squirrels. There are an exception here and there to alarm calls, but usually an alarm call for ground squirrels warns, saves, warns ground squirrels, but doesn't warn anybody else. Here, we've got some protective mechanism that's helping others that should be very, very general. Right? So if you're producing beta-lactamase and you're secreting it out into the environment, that means that anything that happens to be that in that environment and susceptible to, to, to antibiotics should be protected, not just other E. coli cells. So we decided to expand our experimental setup to um, look at the effects of altruism at the community level where I am um, you know, doing things that would drive ecologists crazy. I'm calling a two-species system a community, but it is a community. It's more than one species, and, and we've got, except we're going to look at two species. So two microbial species and um, try and understand something about this, this, this altruism at, 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 at that level, at, at, at the simplest possible community level. And the way that we did it was we took um, the E. coli system we've been working with and we introduced um, salmonella, which is phylogenetically not that distant from E. coli. And um, we had salmonella strains that were susceptible, meaning that they were um, in the presence of antibiotics. If you just grew our beta uh, um, ampicillin in particular, if you grew our salmonella strain that we had, they were all dead. So they were susceptible to ampicillin. And we now have two different species. And our initial uh, hypothesis was barbarically simple, which was that if we grow salmonella in the presence of our altruistic E. coli and we put ampicillin in there, the salmonella that would otherwise be dead should be perfectly fine if they're in the presence of E. coli that are secreting out beta-lactamase. Because beta-lactamase is beta-lactamase, and it breaks down the ampicillin. And if it helps salmonella, it helps salmonella. And you would expect that wherever E. coli is, or wherever anything is that's doing this kind of secreting, there are other things that might be protected by it. So um, again, and just to remind you, our salmonella are completely sensitive uh, on their own to, to ampicillin. All right. So the first thing we did was we um, put salmonella together with our um, altruistic E. coli in the presence of ampicillin. And 
what we find is on the y-axis we have the percent of salmonella when competing against these altruistic E. coli. And over the course of a two-day experiment, you see two things. First of all, it's clearly the case that the salmonella um, are being protected by our E. coli cells because they're dead. The same strain sa sampled um, outside the presence of altruistic E. coli, they're all dead. But here, they survive. And not only that, but they are really, really good competitors against our E. coli at getting the resources in the environment. So they not only survive, they increase. And they make up about 80% of the cells. So at a very basic level, the altruism that's seen in one species has implications for the survival or not of another species in communities that we would expect to see um, these different species together. Then we thought, OK, you know, we've got all these different strains in our lab. And let's just um, run some more competition experiments and make sure that we really understand completely what's going on in, in, in our E. coli system and in this simple community. So we took salmonella, and we competed them against our selfish E. coli strains. And again, selfish E. coli strains, they produce beta-lactamase, but they do not secrete it. And so our prediction was, unlike the altruistic E. coli, if we take salmonella and we put it against our selfish E. coli, then the salmonella should be in trouble. They should all be dead. But that's not what happened. And we ran this many, many times. And we kept getting the same results, which was that um, we had slightly start different starting conditions. But regardless of your starting conditions, you end up approximately in the same place. And, and that same place is that, again, the salmonella not only survive, so they're being protected. Somehow they are being protected against ampicillin, even though selfish E. coli shouldn't do that. And they're, out, they're good competitors against E. coli, so they, so they increased to very high frequency. So we were really, really, at first, confused. And we kept running this to make sure that we didn't screw up something in the experimental setup. And no matter what we did, we kept getting the same results. So that actually, then we started thinking, well, maybe there's something interesting going on here. Maybe, maybe what we're looking at is a system that, that, that is actually has more than altruism, that maybe even has um, um, a kind of parasitism a, 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 that, that somehow that somehow salmonella are doing something that is making typically unselfish E. coli become uh, taking selfish E. coli and making them altruists. We began to think maybe there was some sort of manipulation on the part of the salmonella in our system. That was one possibility. There are lots and lots and lots of other possibilities. So we began to look at this in more detail. And so we first began with some really, really, really simple experiments. Okay? Um, and, and I'm going I'm to run you through a, a whole series of hypotheses that we had for what might be going on with um, salmonella surviving in the presence of selfish E. coli when everything that we did before this would suggest that should not happen. So the first possibility is the simplest. And, and maybe the selfish E. coli strain isn't selfish anymore. So basically, this experiment was done after we ran the whole bunch of E. coli experiments. And maybe something funky happened in the laboratory. And the E. coli strains that we knew were selfish early on in our first round of experiments, something happened. And they were no longer self selfish. And they were, in fact, um, altruists. Maybe they have now begun to leak beta lactamase. Um, so to do this, we competed selfish E. coli strains against E. coli strains that were unprotected. So we took now the same selfish E. coli that had protected our salmonella, and we competed them against um, E. coli that were completely unprotected from, um, from ampicillin. And when you do that, what you find is all of the no-plasmid E. coli cells die when they're placed with the selfish E. coli, which is what you would expect based on all the other E. coli work we did. So it's not just that all of a sudden our selfish E. coli strains have all become unconditional altruists. 
So we began to look for other possibilities. And another simple one goes like this. I said, I said when I started the, this part of the work that um, Salmonella and E. coli are not all that phylogenetically distant from each other, and they certainly are capable of a horizontal gene transfer. And so maybe what's happened is that the E. coli strains aren't doing anything in terms of secreting um, beta-lactamase. It's just that Salmonella has picked up the plasmid that allows them to protect themselves against E. coli, and they've picked it up from the selfish E. coli strains, right? And this could happen in lots and lots of different ways. But basically, the idea is horizontal gene or lateral gene transfer was involved here so that they picked up antibiotic resistance that way from the selfish E. coli. And, um, and there's an easy way to test for this. So here's, um, that's the first um, experimental results I showed you when you compete your selfish types against your uh, selfish E. coli against your salmonella. The salmonella do fine. They shouldn't, but they do. Um, you take out the salmonella that um, uh, are there at the end of that experiment, and you raise them up in the absence of the selfish E. coli, but um, in the presence of ampicillin. If they've picked up the machinery via horizontal gene transfer, then they should be perfectly fine. But when you raise them in the presence of ampicillin but no selfish E. coli, they all die. So it's not just horizontal gene transfer. So we thought, OK, what else might be going on here? Sort of working up to the most interesting but complicated possible explanation. I want to rule out the, um, the simplest possibilities first. So all the experiments we do with Salmonella and E. coli suggest that Salmonella, well, everything else equals Salmonella is a good competitor against E. coli. They, they, they're able to procure resources. They outgrow E. coli. They're very, very good at that. Um, and so they're killing a lot of E. coli cells. And, um, and so maybe what's happened is that when these E. coli cells that are out competed die, uh, their lysedopin, the beta-lactamase inside them, has been released into the medium. And the salmonella are such good competitors that, that there's lots of this um, um, beta-lactamase in the medium. And that's how the salmonella are being protected. It, the selfish E. coli are not um, altruists. It's just that, they're, um, that the salmonella are protected this way. So it turns out that, um, that it's not that difficult to examine this possibility. And, um, and, 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 and the way that you do that is, is and this is, this is the royal we. We, meaning my microbiology colleagues, are able to look for all of the other junk that should be in the medium if, in fact, the E. coli cells are being lysed open and the beta-lactamase is then floating around in the medium. Lots of other stuff should be floating around in the medium as well if there's been lots and lots of lysis. And in fact, that's not what's going on. It's not as if there is all this beta-lactamates that's been released from lyse cells. Okay, so now we get to the more interesting possibilities. And I'm going to show you two more possibilities, but I, I, I want to be fair and tell you at the end of the day, I'm going to say I don't know which of either of these is in fact at play. But I want to at least walk you through two very interesting um, hypotheses for what might be going on here and how you could test them, although we haven't been able to do that quite yet. OK, so. The other experiments show that it's not that these E. coli, these selfish E. coli, have become altruists in the sense that they always secrete beta-lactamase. That's what some of the first experiments show. But it might be that there are certain conditions under which the selfish E. coli, in fact, essentially become altruistic E. coli. That is, under certain conditions, typically selfish E. coli might secrete beta-lactamase. Or beta-lactamase might somehow get out from e selfish E. coli into the environment, which in essence makes them the equivalent of altruists. All right. So this is what we know and what we don't know. 
we know that E. coli cells sometimes produce these things called membrane blebs that you can see at the arrows. They're the little vacuoles on the outside of the cell. They're known as blebs. And under certain conditions, E. coli cells produce these membrane blebs, and, and sometimes lots of them on a cell. Okay, so they sometimes produce this. Sometimes membrane blebs contain beta-lactamase. Sometimes blebs break off the E. coli cell and float around in the medium and open up. Bleb production in E. coli, this is other people's work, not our own. Bleb production in E. coli is often tied to stressful conditions. When the conditions for the E. coli cells are stressful, they tend to produce more membrane blebs than when the conditions aren't stressful. In our case, it might be that salmonella is such a good competitor, we know that, that that might be what is the equivalent of a stressful set of conditions for E. coli. So the argument goes that these E. coli cells are selfish. When you put them against other unprotected E. coli cells, they do not, the other unprotected cells die. There's nothing that the selfish E. coli does then. But under the conditions of a stressful environment, they might produce these membrane blebs that might, under certain conditions, contain beta-lactamase, break off and open up in the environment, which essentially turns the um, selfish E. coli into the equivalent of uh, altruistic E. coli. There, some of the beta-lactamase they produce is being put out into the medium, and it's protecting the salmonella. Now, we haven't been able to get the money or the resources to test this, but it's certainly a real possibility. There's even a more interesting possibility. This, um, if, if, you were, if, uh, if you were a behavioral ecologist and this was happening in warm, fuzzy things, you would, you would say that this is sort of um, an indirect kind of manipulation. So, so salmonella, um, the, the salmonella isn't doing anything except what salmonella does. They, 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 they compete for the resources very well against E. coli. And that has a, 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 a kind of domino effect that, that makes E. coli produce these membrane blebs which break off and then have the effect of protecting salmonella. But salmonella is just doing what salmonella always does, which is trying to procure as many resources in the environment as it can. And there's sort of as a byproduct of that, they turn selfish E. coli into the equivalent of altruistic E. coli. But there's a more interesting possibility, again, that you, know, you would think about if you were a behavioral ecologist. And, and so I, I've said what we don't know here. So we don't know if that's going on, but it's possible. Okay. The more interesting possibility goes something like this. That salmonella are actively manipulating E. coli into secreting or pumping out or getting out some of that beta-lactamase in E. coli. So um, here is what we know in terms of this possible explanation for going, what's going on. Other people who have worked with salmonella have discussed this, what's known as a type 6 secretion system. And this type 6 secretion system in salmonella is capable of piercing but not killing E. coli cells. And this is not our diagram. This is the diagram of people who work with type 6 secretion systems. And they look like little possible, you know, little projectiles, little missiles that when pushed out could pierce something like an E. coli cell without killing it. We know that they have type 6 secretion systems. What we don't know is whether or not the salmonella strains we use in our laboratory use type 6 secretion systems. And if they do, we don't know if they're in fact using them in the experiments that we're running. But it's certainly a possibility. And that would be something more 
like the active manipulation of turning a selfish type into an altruist. So you could do all sorts of really cool behavioral ecology experiments here if you had the money and the resources, which we don't have yet, to look at this type 6 secretion um, system hypothesis. So for example, the first thing you could do is just ask whether or not the salmonella that we have are using this, whether or not when they use it, they, 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 they pierce but don't kill E. coli, and that causes some of the beta-lactamase to come out. And if they did, that would be interesting, and it would certainly fall under this category of them manipulating the E. coli from being selfish types to non-selfish types. Um, but more interesting would be to run experiments like this. Ask whether or not the salmonella who have type 6 secretion systems use them in certain situations but not others. So you could ask whether or not they, for ex so it's got to, we don't know, but the assumption would be there's some cost of turning on, expressing, and using this kind of type 6 secretion system. Do they always do that? So is that just something that Salmonella does when they're around anything else? Or is it something that they do when they're in a situation that they could potentially get some benefit, like getting E. coli cells. Again, they'd have to have some mechanism to sense what's going on in terms of what E. coli are present and, what, and what, what's present and what isn't present. But they certainly have those, you know, we, in other microbial systems, we certainly have evidence for that kind of ability. And so um, one could set up these kinds of experiments. So basically where we're left with, 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 the, um, with the salmonella system is that somehow or another, so first of all, if you put altruists with them, they're perfectly happy, and you can get altruism having community level effects. With the selfish case, we know what's not going on. What we don't know quite yet is how the salmonella, the presence of salmonella is making selfish E. coli strains into altruists. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to get some funds to do that over time. So I've already done this. Um, and I'll end the following way. Um, we like this system. We want to keep working on it um, because we think it has implications at all different levels. So there's the evolutionary implication, which is that um, first you can find the coexistence of altruists and non-altruists, um, but you also may have a system in which um, altruism in one species protects individuals in another species, and you could certainly expand that out to a much more complicated kind of community and see how far that goes. Ecologically, you can make the argument that you're basically, um, you've got a system here that's more likely to promote community diversity, which is sort of not unrelated to the first point, but a more ecological perspective on the same phenomenon. Um, and then, in terms of the medical implications, this is pretty far away from what I do, and I, I'm, I'll be curious to see what people in the audience have to say about this. But let me just throw one wild idea by you in terms of what kind of medical implications might come from something like this. Again, keeping in mind, our E. coli don't normally do this. They don't naturally do this. But there are plenty of things that do, do, do this kind of natural secretion. When you, have a, when you have a species in which they're naturally secreting something like a, like a beta-lactamase, then it might be worth trying to figure out how to specifically target those cells, if they're producing something like beta-lactamase, beta which is what we don't want them to do if we're talking about um, critters that are causing disease, right? We want our antibiotics to work. We don't want cells to be protected. If your goal when you use antibiotics, right, is to get rid of all of whatever the dangerous agent you're looking at is, be it E. coli or salmonella or whatever, right? If your goal is to get rid of all of them, well, there are different ways you could do it. You could try and create a, a procedure that literally kills all of the cells you're trying to kill. But if you have a system in which some of the cells are secreting and some of them aren't, then if you could target the ones that were secreting, then you could get rid of the problem without having to get rid of every single cell yourself because by getting rid of the secretors, you would get rid of the protective mechanism that might be protecting cells that are, themselves would normally die in the presence of antibiotics. So I'm not saying that's an easy thing to be able to do, but if you could, it might be, it might be a cost-benefit 
that it might be better from a cost-benefit perspective. I, I'm not sure, but it's the kind of thing that you could think about in, in this kind of system. So I should stop here, and um, I could take some questions. We could chat, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lee. Um, five minutes, maybe seven minutes for questions. And this microphone doesn't sound loud because it's only for people on the video online later. I'm going to ask someone to help pass it around. Uh, nice talk. So I think critical for you is measuring the PEDA lactamase in the media, right? Do you keep that always constant? Because another hypothesis could be that those E. coli, ultra, is the, no, selfish E. coli, function as a filter. Right, they take off the beta lactamase, kind of reduce the concentration in the media. So do you in any way control for that? Yes, yeah, so we're constantly, um, we're infusing, and we're infusing um, the system with more uh, ampicillin, first of all. So, so I mean, so, um, and we are um, removing waste products from our system. Okay, so so it, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. You're, you're it depends on the concentration at the end, right? So we're measure the concentration. Yes, and we are trying to keep that concentration as constant as we possibly can, so that it's not just E. coli breaking it down and having this indirect effect. Yeah, yeah. It seems like both of your final hypotheses require that there's beta lactamase being released into the medium. You, you checked for the other contents of the E. coli, but did you, did you see whether beta lactamase was being released? Uh, I get the, the first part of the question, yes. That's what we, um, it requires that. And so what was the... Uh, well, so, so both the, um, the, the what, T6 secretion system, right. which would pierce and release, and the thought is it's, it's getting beta lactamase out of the... E. Right, coli. right, right, right. And the other... Both um, of them require beta lactamase yeah. to be out in the medium. Yeah, do you, so do you detect it in the medium? Yes, but we don't... Well, uh, yes, but, but what we don't know yet is how it's getting... So we know that it's not through the lysis from the E. coli, right. but we don't know how it's getting there. It is getting into the medium, but yes. you know it's not through the lysis because you don't see the other contents of that's the E. coli. That's right. Okay. That's all we know, that's, that's unfortunately. And then just for the, this last medical implications point here... Um, I think there's, there's at least two aspects of this. This doesn't require altruists, right? Because you've got, in your last cool experiments, you've got selfish E. coli that are protecting their other, their um, other species. Right. We could right. get into a semantic argument, but that's okay. right. Yeah. Right. Fine. <laughs> but um, it also seems to me that you could try to play the game where you put in benign cells. Imagine salmonella is benign, and it actually keeps down the more pathogenic uh, species that has the antibiotic. And so you could actually control the the pathogen through a, a con oh this oh okay yeah 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 that's that that right that's that because well yeah so I guess then the question would be right um, whether or not we we, we haven't done um, enough with the um, with the selfish E. coli versus Salmonella to really feel confident yet that um, that you know whatever it was eighty percent value that we got is is, is 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 a good estimate and fairly stable, right? Because you would you would expect that um, it, it is in the sense that my guess is if you if Salmonella um, was to um, get to much higher frequencies, there simply would not be enough of this selfish E. coli to one way or another produce uh, the beta lactamase that we still don't know how that's getting out. But right, so that's right. That's a, that's a good point. Um, and, and, I, and, and I hadn't thought about that. Right, so you could basically use the salmonella as an agent to, to keep down the, the altruists, which are altruists from an evolutionary perspective, but nasty from the medical perspective. Yeah, that's good. In the uh, first part of your talk, you uh, showed that if you put uh, uh, cheaters in <coughs> with the uh, altruists, you would first get, sorry, with the non-altruists, you would first get a, uh, a uh, five per, per percent uh, cheater uh, population, which would be rising to about 10 or 12 percent a couple of days later. Do you have an explanation for, for that rise? And no, no, so I'm sorry, that, that was not, um, those were two different 
th those were two different groups that were on the same graph. So the 5% and the 12.5%, that was a comparison between, the 5% was the frequency of, of dummy cells when they're competing against altruists. The 12.5% was the frequency of cheater types when they were competing against the altruists. And the explanation, our, exp our, our explanation, what? Uh, but in the first day or, or so, it was a five, then it went up to 12. In that's that, that you show. Uh, I, I don't think so, but let me. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, uh, no. I mean, I mean, I just, you know, it takes, it takes time. I, I don't have an explanation for that well, particular. I was <laughs> wondering whether it's the same adaptation that E. coli is doing as what you see in cell, in cell uh, Nella, so whether there is any kind of, oh. a, of an adaptation oh, oh, oh. in cell uh, um, Oh, 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 okay. Um, I don't think... So we never went back and did anything in the E. coli system alone that would allow me to answer that question. But it's a good question, and I don't, I don't have an answer for it. It's, it on first glance, I think it's a po it, it, I understand what you're saying, and I think it's hy it, hypothetically possible. I want to think about it more, but I don't, I, I don't know if, that is, if, if anything like that is going on or, or not um, in, in, in the E. coli system. But I understand it, and it's a, it's a good question. I wish we had time for more questions.